In this episode, Sean Hopkin and I discuss the doctrine of Christ and try and flesh out what it really is and some things that we often overlook as we read it and and trying to find out the real focus and emphasis of the doctrine of Christ. And Sean also helps us see the temple imagery in there and how the temple and the vision and the doctrine are all about the same thing, but he highlights in a really wonderful way that temple imagery and brings home to us how the doctrine of Christ should affect us in our lives. So I have to tell you, I just love our sponsors for this week. It's Bombora Ties. Uh, they make neckties. And as a family, we always tried to give uh, the girls like an Easter dress for Christmas and the boys, uh, uh, when they needed a new suit, we gave them a suit. But it's gotten to be ties now. Uh, and uh, so we try and find uh, a tie that uh, just kind of they can wear to church or whatever. But anyway, it's a great gift. We, you might want a gift like this as well, even if it's not for Easter. Bombora Ties are cool. It's from a family-owned uh, organization. Uh, they they started this uh, a guy named Zeke, part of this family, uh, was in Hawaii uh, surfing every day, and he wanted to combine his his love for surfing and his his board shirt designs with and uh, combine that with ties instead of have having boring neckties. So they started to make these really cool ties. I have some and I love them. Uh, they're water repellent, they're stain resistant, they're four way stretch, they're machine washable, they're wrinkle proof. They have cool designs. The one I my favorite one I have palm trees on it. Uh, it, it works for all sorts of things. Uh, they're local, just family owned company. They're founded in, in, or they're based in Park City. They're founded in 2019. And my listeners can get a 20% discount up through March 31st. You can get a 20% discount. So you go to Bombora Ties. That's B O M B O R A Ties. So bomboraties.com and enter the code T S A R for the scriptures are real. T S A R 20. And you get 20% off. Great ties, great prices. They're durable. They're fashionable. They're fun. Uh, they're tough. They're great for missionaries because missionaries are death on ties, but these ties don't die. Uh, they're great for kids for Easter. I think you'll just love them. So again, that's bomboraties.com and enter the code TSAR20 for 20% off. Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have helped them become more real to us because we believe that allows them, us to apply them to our lives more and draw more power out of them, and we need all the help we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and I'm so happy to have back with me today uh, my good friend and colleague and even department chair, though he probably would rather I don't think of him that way. But anyway, uh, Sean Hopkin, who is... Uh, uh, just been on the podcast before. We don't need to do a, a lot of introduction of him. Uh, I'll, I'll say if you haven't heard, uh, I will do a short introduction in a minute, but uh, you may know him if you go back and listen. We did an episode with him and his father when we did the Psalms. Uh, we did some Isaiah together. Sean's one of the other teachers that teaches Isaiah quite a bit. Uh, we talked last year about the parables of the lost and so on. You'll love all those episodes. So welcome, Sean. Thanks for being with us. Really great to be with you. And yes, as far as department chair goes, we pass the baton around in the department. So uh, when it's time to pass the potato to the next person, uh, that'll be great. But uh, in the meantime, uh, yeah, Carrie's been a friend and mentor, as I've said in previous episodes, going way back. I'm really grateful for his influence. This is great. And and this is a hot potato, I think, the, this chair. A, a little bit at times. It's great. Uh, we have, as uh, Carrie will affirm, really wonderful colleagues, and it's wonderful to be able to teach the scriptures. So, well, we're glad to have you with us. So, I'll just say that uh, Dr. Hopkins is, uh, uh, I mean, has his PhD from University of Texas, right? Uh, in Hebrew and Arabic. And uh, we've even spent time in Oxford together. Oh, go ahead. And, and well, why don't you correct me and then tell us more of what we should know? No, no, that's correct. Uh, medieval Iberian literature, uh, literature from the Iberian Peninsula, although I've done a lot of Old Testament things, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, yeah. things like that. Um, but that did lead to Hebrew, Arabic, and Spanish literature. So, yeah. When I present at conferences, all eight of the people listening are fascinated. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how it goes, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, you get these really specialized disciplines. Um and uh, you were in seminaries and institutes for a while. I thought you think you taught institute while you were there in, in Texas and uh, and so on. So anyway, 
all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, anything else we should know? You have a uh, you have a child on a mission right now, don't you? We our youngest is on a mission in New Zealand with only about nine months left, wow. and two grandkids. Uh, he doesn't have kids, uh, of yeah. course, but uh, two grandkids from our oldest child who live way too far away in Oregon, but uh, a shout out to Bennett and Brielle, who will probably never listen to this. So <laughs> uh, Wonderful. So which mission is your son in? He's in the Hamilton mission, and wonderful. he's just really loving his time over there. Oh, good for him. I have a brother who served in uh, uh, New Zealand and loved it, so it's good stuff. Yeah. Well, all right. We are talking about some of my favorite chapters in the Book of Mormon, some of the most powerful chapters, and I've been telling my audience to, to kind of be looking for themes from – Nephi's vision and uh, uh, some things from uh, the uh, Isaiah and a couple other things, but that that you're going to see these themes popping up in here. So now it's time to really uh, get at the, I, th I think this is in some ways where Nephi wraps up all, everything he's learned from his ministry. And uh, we're going to look through here in 2 Nephi 31 through 33, uh, mostly 31 and 32, but we will go elsewhere in the Book of Mormon as well. Um, so I don't know. In many of our discussions, I just uh, the, that we let the guests kind of guide it. But I think this one, Sean and I have talked, and this is going to be more of a, a dialogue, a kind of a back and forth. We both have some things we love to say and teach about this particular thing. Uh, why don't you start us out, Sean, and you can just talk about uh, just kind of anywhere you'd like to go, frame this for us, talk about it, just take us where you want to go, and then I'll jump in as well. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so one of the things that I think is fascinating, when you see it, it's hard to unsee it, although certainly this is a, a, a theory that I, I'll propose, I've proposed before, that you you might not agree with it, but but I think it's it becomes fairly clear once you see the way Nephi is using imagery is that he is using imagery to teach what we know as the doctrine of Christ, what he calls the doctrine of Christ, and he's using imagery of the divine ascent uh, in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible tabernacle, where under the Mosaic Covenant, as far as we have in our text today, only the high priest could ascend on one day of the year uh, into the Holy of Holies, and that Nephi seems to be using imagery that would be very meaningful to his people to sort of enhance, give strength to, provide some uh, beauty and sort of touch points as he teaches what he calls and others call the doctrine of Christ. And, and so there's some really fascinating elements that we can we can look at. One, one thing I'll say quickly, and then I'll be quiet for a moment, uh, see if Kerry's got anything he wants to add, is the other language besides doctrine of Christ, which shows up elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, it shows up in a, a document that hasn't been written yet in the King James Version translation of Epistle to the Hebrews. Doctrine of Christ talks about that doctrine in similar kinds of ways. Yeah. What Latter-day Saints would think of as the first principles and ordinances of the gospel and some other things. But then he also uses language of the way, which he there's a lot of places he could have, you know, sort of be building from. But Isaiah talks about in the last days, and, and he uses temple imagery, that the mountain of the house of the Lord, and there will be god's way we will learn of god's way right yeah. and so there's a lot of sort of beautiful things that nephi uh, from my perspective is pulling together here that i think enhance our reading of 31 and 32 yeah i, I would agree he pulls in so many images and so many things in so many ways it's masterful and and by now our, our careful study and priming for these things should help us see it all come together here i'm, I'm really excited for it well so, uh, Carrie, shall I go ahead and just show a few of those elements, or are there some things you'd like to say? Well, before? Yeah, if it's all right, let me kind of uh, jump in a little bit, and maybe I can like kind of start walking us through a little bit, and then you can jump in with uh, those elements and so on. But I'll just uh, put it this way, and and I'm hoping that this is a different experience for our audience as they learn about the doctrine of Christ here, because I've found when I teach this, I give my students a pretest. And I asked them, okay, what is the doctrine of Christ? And they all, pretty much every semester, every student says the same things. And I think we're kind of primed for it by the articles of faith, as you said, the first principles and ordinances. So everyone will say, well, there's faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. And I would agree with that. But what I always show them is, okay, that is part of it, but you're, you're missing it. And there is a scripture study key or clue 
that can help you see that there's more. Um, so in the ancient world and ancient texts, we often get what is called, and this will sound like it's legal language, but and maybe it's drawing from legal language, but we get what's called an inclusio. And an inclusio is where you say what you're going to talk about at the beginning of it, and then you talk about it, and then the end, you say, this is what I've talked about, so that you know that everything between those two inclusios is what you were talking about. Very similar to how quotation marks focus, function for us, right? You put a quote at the beginning, and then you put a quote at the end, and you know everything in between is what that person said. So there are inclusios for each of the iterations that uh, of the doctrine of Christ, because we're going to find that this is in third Nephi or second Nephi 31 and 32. It's in third Nephi 11. It's in third Nephi 27. I think there's a short, small version of Moroni eight. Um, so uh, let's look for those inclusios. So, and, and then if, if we do this, so it, you're going to see it starting in verse two, wherefore the things which I have written sufficeth me, save it be a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ, wherefore I speak unto you plainly according to the plainness of my prophesying. So that's telling us everything after this is part of the doctrine of Christ. And then we'll get the the ending inclusio at the very end um, of, of this, where in the last verse, verse 21, he tells us this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We'll come back to that later. But everything in between is the doctrine of Christ. He reopens it in, in uh, chapter 32. But in the midst of that, he tells us anyone who declares more or less than this has a problem. And I think we often declare less because yeah. we don't look at everything that is in between those two inclusios. We, we cherry pick those things that agree with our article of faith four, and we say, okay, we're, we're done. So I want us to kind of look at everything that is in between those inclusios. So, um, and maybe we'll just start and then you, I'll, I'll just start us. And I think this is where you'll want to cue and, and talk about some things I suspect you want to talk about. Right. But I think we start in verse four. So we had verse two is when he tells us he's going to talk about the doctrine of Christ. And verse three tells us, and I want to make it so you can understand it. Verse four I would that ye should remember that I have spoken unto you concerning that prophet which the Lord had showed unto me that should baptize the Lamb of God, which should take away the sins of the world. Now, of course, he's drawing on his vision where he saw John baptize Christ, and he's talking about John. And and so we see that, and we immediately want to jump into, well, see, it's about baptism. And it is about baptism, absolutely, 100%. It's about, well, it is, it is 100% true that it's about baptism. But that's not the only thing he's talking about here. Because his focus starts to be on, well, let's let's go to verse 7. All right, so he's going to say Christ has to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, right? He doesn't need to be baptized because he's sinful, but he needs to be baptized because God commanded it. And I think there's an interesting catch-22 there. If Christ doesn't need to be baptized because he hasn't committed a sin, but if he weren't baptized, then he would need to be baptized because yeah. he wouldn't have been obedient, right? Agreed, um, agreed. Yeah, and uh, but but his emphasis really is um, verse seven. Know ye not that he was being holy, but notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping the commandments. So I am going to submit that there's a, a twofold element here besides the baptism part. And that is that Christ is the exemplar, that we need to follow Christ. And we're going to see that come up again and again in these verses. Uh, it's in verse 9. Uh, he, having set the example before them, is how that ends, and so on. And verse 10, he said to the children of men, Follow thou me, wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we should be willing to keep the commandments of the Father. So this emphasis that we follow Christ, he's the exemplar, we emulate or we follow Christ. And second, that the primary attribute that we need to emulate is that Christ submits his will to the Father. And so we should follow his example in completely and fully submitting ourselves to the Father. And exhibit A for that is baptism. So uh, I, I wanted to kind of start us out there. I think there's more we'll see that is, goes beyond faith, repentance, baptism. But, but I think that's the first thing that Nephi really emphasizes is follow Christ's example, especially in submitting your will to the Father or being unified with the Father. So... Go ahead, Sean. Well, I, I love that. I think that uh, make sure that the power of the doctrine that Nephi is teaching is squarely in the center of his teachings, that it's not just a to-do list sort of a an idea, but that the doctrine of Christ is about Christ, right? Yeah. Not about doing stuff uh, as, as important. You know, we can we can submit and show 
Christ, that our heart is his by seeking to do what, uh, by following his path and seeking to do what he's asked us to do. But it's about Christ's power and his journey that gives our journey power. Yeah. Very good. And if we're going to talk about that way, that way is to the Father, right? And yes. it's through Christ, but it's by Christ submitting to the Father and us submitting to Christ and so on. Yeah, good. And, and we could give way a capital W, w right? So yes. Christ is the way, mm -hmm. right? So yep. we like to, so Christ is walking on a way, true. Christ is showing the way, true. Christ is the way. Um, and and th this is really fun. And in fact, before I talk about that way a little bit, let me just mention, uh, and I hope I'm not stealing any thunder from things you wanted to say, Carrie. But, uh, There's no thunder to be stolen. We're, yeah. we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we'll be lightning and then the thunder together. <laughs> good. So, kachinga, kachinga, kachinga. Yeah. Uh, yes, that was, uh, uh, that was Lightning McQueen. And, uh, That's right. Ka-chow. Oh, yeah, ka-chow. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, Elder Holland, interestingly enough, when he talks about the Book of Mormon, one of the times when he talks about the Book of Mormon, he points to this submission theme, mm -hmm. and he points to it in Third Nephi 11. And I love, as, as always, the turn of phrase that he uses, you know, he says, here they are, they've been waiting hundreds of years for him to come. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, he says, every tape recorder is out. This talk was given uh, a few yeah. years ago, as you can tell. Uh, every pen is poised. What will he say? And really, basically, the first thing that he refers to is, I have submitted to the Father. This yes. is the message. And then, of course, he goes, he tracks back to when Nephi, in, in First Nephi uh, 4, this very challenging moment where Nephi does this difficult uh, task with Laban, that he trembles and would that he might not. Now, and I can't remember if Elder Holland points to this or not, but that language is the same language that Jehovah or Christ uses in the Doctrine and Covenants when he's talking about his atoning sacrifice. I trembled and would that I might not, nevertheless. Yeah. So we do that which we, which God asks us to do, and as Christ has shown us the noble way to do. Uh, so lots of beautiful possibilities for discussion uh, tied up in all of this. Absolutely. Yeah, but it, but that's the that's the attribute that is going to lead to everything else in the doctrine of Christ. It, everything else will naturally happen if we start there. Christ submitted himself to the Father. We are following his example by submitting ourselves to Christ and the Father. Christ will bring us to the Father, and I think he's going to keep coming back to that. And you've already shown how he comes back to in 3 Nephi 11 and so on, but yeah. All right, so do you have more you want to talk about there, or, or uh, should we yeah, keep going? Let, let me talk about this way and uh, epistle to the hebrews even though of course it hasn't been written when nephi is speaking is actually helpful to sort of check whether this reading is a good reading because that epistle is going to connect the doctrine of christ faith repentance baptism gift of the holy ghost these sort of points along the journey um uh where we submit to the father's will these points along the journey with the high, the ancient high priest's divi divine ascent into the Holy of Holies. And it's even going to say, of course, eventually go on to say, Christ's flesh being the veil that we pass through to enter into the presence of the Father. And so it's going to also make these connections that Nephi is making, which helps encourage me that that this reading is is an appropriate one and a helpful one. And and so let's let's mention that reading. There is some imagery that we come to just find familiar over time time as Latter-day Saints, but when you step step back a moment, you think, wait, this is, why is it Nephi bringing these images in? So let me read to you from 2 Nephi 31, 17 through 18. For the gate, so there's gate mm -hmm. imagery here that we become used to because we read this and we talk about it, but the gate by which you should enter is repentance and baptism by water. Then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then are ye in this straight and narrow path, or in other words, in this way, which leads to eternal life, ye have entered by the gate. And then notice he's going to go on and talk about, um, uh, if you go on to 2 Nephi 32, look at verse 3. Once you're in that gate, you need to feast upon the words of Christ, for the words of Christ will tell you all things what you should do. 
and verse five, the Holy Ghost will show unto you all things that ye should do. So you've got faith brings us to repentance, and then repentance leads to baptism. Baptism causes us to enter into the gate. Once we're in the gate, there's these feasting images and these showing images. So now if we're going to link this to the divine ascent that the high priest would take on the Holy of Holies, uh, or sorry, uh, on the Day of Atonement into the Holy of Holies, then all of a sudden you can see potential tie-ins with faith leading you to the altar of sacrifice, right? Where we place the old the enemy, the natural man, it, talking from sort of Christian perspectives, on that altar, the animal within us on the altar, and we decide to move forward. There's a separation scene from the old us to our new lives. And then that laver of water, not uh, insinuating that baptisms were done there, but that Nephi is using the imagery of the laver of water. They're both washing images, yes. right? Absolutely. Washing images to point to Christ's baptism and our baptism, the need to accept that which God is offering us. And then this gate, you are in, you're past some kind of a door. And if you think of the tabernacle or the temple, now you've, you've entered into the house and you've entered in the correct way and you're protected a little bit better from the elements. You're in the community of Christ, the covenantal community of Christ, where, as President Nelson has so beautifully discussed, there is chesed, God's covenantal merciful love offered to you. By the way, uh, President Nelson, uh, I, I'm speaking with someone who has written uh, persuasively about this as well. Carrie, uh, I think everybody knows, is familiar with your book um, talking about uh, ancient covenants. So uh, that that's really important language there. So uh, then at that point then, there's a table of showbread, which according to the Mishnah had bread and wine on it. And for Christians, that sacramental Eucharistic imagery is pretty powerful as we sort of build on that ancient imagery. So there's feasting images. There's a, a blazing menorah that uh, Nephi I'm proposing is saying, hey, the Holy Ghost is going to show you what to do. And then he's going to go on and say, what you need to do is learn how to speak with the tongue of angels. And if you look forward in that ancient tabernacle, you see cherubim stitched on the veil, and you need to learn how to ascend into the presence of God by speaking the tongue of angels, and then you pass through the veil, symbolically speaking, into the presence of God. Well, physically speaking, the high priest passes through the veil, symbolically, into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And, and I just propose that Nephi is using this imagery, and, and Hebrews does as well, to say there is this divine ascent, and the high priest walked it, showing that Christ, the perfect one, would walk it, showing that we then are going to be invited to walk it in the last days. Yeah. That's beautiful, beautiful. And I'd say, so to me, there, there's this uh, fascinating interplay that uh, ancient authors and that we go through uh, in terms of there are so many uh, ways that God, in his abundant mercy and desire to teach us, so many ways that he teaches us about the need to come to him. And so we start using them, uh, to inter, uh, we would call it intertextuality as, as scholars, but uh, they they interplay with each other, right? So uh, I, I think we're, we, would, we could easily say, Nephi is trying to teach us the way to be with God again. The temple is trying to teach us the way to be with God again. And so Nephi naturally, and I think that he believes that the vision he has seen teaches uh, it's another set of symbols that teach us the way to be with God again and so he's taking all of it and tying it together with images that draw on on both his vision the temple uh just normal journeys all those kind of a thing uh he sees all of these as ways to teach us about the way to be with God again and and the interplay of those images I find especially of the temple and his vision I find that really powerful and fascinating and moving so that we remember these things we really do remember the doctrine of Christ because of the images that Nephi interweaves there that's beautiful stuff 
we we have a doctrine uh, that we received from Joseph Smith that it, and it's in our res restoration scripture as well that uh, God is the same God from beginning to end. And so there, there's going to be differences historically and different needs and different languages that are going to be used throughout time. And so in one sense, we are foreigners on a foreign territory, ter territory when we visit ancient times. In another sense, all of God's children have been loved by him, and he has had the plan that will help them ascend into his presence. So you should be expected to, you should expect to find significant differences, but you should also expect to find similarity in mm -hmm. approach as God encourages his people. And let me just give you a little bit more, Carrie, um, sort of fascinating. He's going to say, he's going to pause in Second Nephi 32 and say, I it seems like maybe some of you aren't understanding and it's frustrating. I'm giving it to you as plain as I can. If you, if you haven't figured it out, you need to ask. And he uses ask language. Of course, the scriptures use ask, seek, knock, which then uh, ironically in English, the first letter of those spell ask, ask, seek, knock, yeah. ask, ask God. But Nephi is going to use knock language. And, and the, the last element that we haven't mentioned in the tabernacle is this altar of incense that symbolizes prayer ascending yeah. at the veil. And, and by the way, well, first, Nephi is going to say, you got, I'm giving it to you as plain as I can, and you need to follow Christ's example in these things until he shall appear unto you. And I think Book of Mormon context, that's 3rd Nephi 11, right? This is what right. you're going to do until 3rd Nephi 11, and then whatever he tells you to do, you should do. But there's also a reality that God does long to communicate with us. He's seeking to bring us into his presence and, and have us be ones who understand prophetesses and prophets, prophetic, lowercase p, prophetic figures who understand God's plan. He can communicate with us to guide us, and then we can, through him, help guide others in missionary efforts, in just our, our yeah. uh, family uh, environments with our friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we bring people to Christ so that he can bring them to the Father, right? That's, that's our job. He's the light we hold up and so on and so on, but we, that's our job. Yeah, beautiful. Well, what if we do this? Uh, I'd like to kind of keep going through and showing some of these different elements that we often don't see or notice. And as we do so, you jump in and comment and so on and highlight th these other things that you'd like to highlight, if that's okay. That's wonderful. Um, Let me add one thing, Carrie. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you're don't about be to sorry. And I'm going to pause you here uh, because I was about to say something. And then it, by the oh, time sorry. I finished on my other thing, I had lost it. Um Notice how the New Testament opens with this same theme uh, of Zacharias yeah. praying. It's his it's his lot. The lot has fallen upon him not to go into the Holy of Holies, but he's offering prayer at the veil yeah. as the priest at the incense circle. altar. That's right. At the yeah. altar of incense, which is prayer at the veil. And what happens? Well, there's angels stitched on that veil. And then right. an angel shows up at the veil with a message from God. How are you going to enter into the presence of God? Well, God is going to descend among you, right? Yeah. And so this pattern plays forward. God, and, and to Carrie's point, it's not about like little, it's not about a to-do list. This is about God loving us and saying, I'm, I'm, I've opened a way through Christ for you to enter into my presence and return to me. I long for you yes. to come back into my presence as covenant in a covenantal relationship. You got to take it seriously, right? But come and, and let me communicate with you. And President Nelson is talking about these themes all the time. We need to learn yeah. to hear him. We need to think celestial, right? We need to point yeah. ourselves towards the Lord. So that's beautiful. And, and I'm with you. I think that's one of the most beautiful images in scripture where Zechariah looks towards the veil where he's expecting to see the the stitched image of an angel and he sees the real deal. And that angel is there to tell him about the event and the person who will make it so that there is no veil. Uh, and you can go through the veil, which Zechariah couldn't that day, but everyone could by the end of, of the Savior's ministry when the veil is torn, right? And so oh, that's beautiful, that's beautiful stuff. Yeah, thank uh, you, Gary. So, uh, and let's, so let's look for that imagery. Uh, if we were to go back to the beginning of 2 Nephi 31, so we'll kind of cover some of that same ground, but I want to point out some things. So we've, we've talked about the need to follow Christ's example, 
and submit ourselves to the Father. And one of the first steps for that is going to be baptized, being baptized, right? Um, and we get uh, the, uh, all these things I've read, but uh, with baptism, we get in verse 12, and the Father said, repent ye, repent ye. So we've got repentance there. We're going to have faith actually come in later, but it is a real part of this, but it's just not mentioned in this first iteration. Uh, so verse 11, repent ye, repent ye, be baptized in the name of my son, and also the voice of the son. So I want you to notice you're hearing both voices. That's going to come up a number of times. Came unto me saying, he that is baptized in my name, to him will let the Father give the Holy Ghost. So we've got now re baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, but we also have the Father and the Son being tied with the Holy Ghost there. So keep that in mind. And, it, and then he says, like unto me, wherefore, follow me and do the things which you've seen me do. So we're, we've circled back around to that following Christ who submits himself to the Father. And then Nephi is just going to say the same thing. I know that if you'll follow the Son with full purpose of heart, no hypocrisy. So that's, again, this is about the heart. It's about your intent. It's about why you're doing it. It's not the checklist. You have to be doing this really wanting to submit your will to the Father and the Son. Um, and then he says, again, you, you repent your sin, uh, repent of your sins, uh, witnessing unto the Father. So the Father is continually part of this, by the way. Uh, and we have to be willing to take upon ourselves the name of Christ through baptism. And then he talks about uh, so, some language we need to recognize here. He says, uh, by following your Lord, so there's the following part again, and your Savior, notice the focus on Christ and his saving abilities, down into the water, according to his word, behold, then you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Yea, then cometh the baptism of fire. So keep that imagery in mind as well. And of the Holy Ghost. And then can ye speak with the tongue of angels. Now, you've already brought that up, but let's let's keep it in mind. All right. And then verse 14. But and but behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, After you have repented of your sins and witness unto the Father that you're willing to keep my commandments by the baptism of water and have received the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost and can speak with the new tongue, even with the tongue of angels. Notice how that keeps being associated with the Holy Ghost. After this, if you denied me, then it would be better you hadn't known me. And I heard a voice from the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. So we get endure to the end being introduced there, but it's by the Father bearing witness of the Son. So what I want to bring up here is that we, we keep getting this, and you're going to see it even more clearly in another one, but in every iteration of the gospel or the doctrine of Christ, you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost bearing witness of each other. You get two divine witnesses for every member of the Godhead, and you have the their full unity emphasized. Um, so we, we kind of go through that, and we get in verse 16. He says, so that's how I know that you need to endure to the end in following the example of the Son. Right. So that emphasis. And then he starts over again. And we don't need to read the whole thing, but he, he goes through the same list again in verses 17 through 21. He talks about, okay, follow him, uh, uh, keep the commandments of the Father, you receive the Holy Ghost, you need to have faith, is in verse 19, uh, and then we get this idea of enduring to the end and so on. But we, we get all of it, and, and in verse 21 is when he talks about this is the way, and there isn't another way, nor name, right? So the way is Christ, as you said. Uh, all of it is just repeated. We go through the whole cycle again, but notice again, I want to read verse 20. Wherefore, you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope. Let's not forget that, all right? And a love of God and of all men. Notice the covenantal connections, right? Uh, and wherefore, if you shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, you shall have eternal life. And I, I think for most people, that becomes the emphasis. Endure to the end by feasting upon the, the words of Christ. And we just kind of make this assumption, yeah, that's the scriptures, and we move on. Partially because he is drawing on this imagery of the word of God in the the vision that he's had. Um, and we assume, yeah, that's the scriptures, and, and we move on. But uh, in, in verse 32, I want to show that there's something a little more going on. So, Or chapter 32. Before we move to chapter 32, anything you want to say or comment on that? So I've kind of, now I'm talking. Uh, oh, but, that's great. Uh, yeah, I love it. So maybe just the one thing I'll say is you've pointed to it already. It's a very unique situation when you have this interplay of this, uh, the Christ or the Son speaking, and then the Father, the voice of the Father affirming it, and this dual witness. Uh, there aren't really other places in scripture. So you'll have the father show up and say, this is my beloved son, hear him. And so that kind of a, a dual witness is there. This is much more pronounced. And, yeah. and I, we're not exactly sure whether this is Christ 
as the representing the father or whether this really is the voice of the father uniquely so um but this duality of witness and the oneness of the message is gonna as uh, i'm sure carrie will will walk through uh, a little bit later on in third nephi 27 when he's talking about the gospel the and, and third nephi 11 as well the unity of yeah. the godhead is such a big deal in the doctrine of Christ and and His gospel, so in, in fact, I find it is is one of the central tenets of the the doctrine of Christ that we usually just skip over. We don't have it, but that that full unity which Christ is inviting us into when He invites us to follow Him as He's followed the Father, He's inviting us into that. But that full unity is a huge part of that doctrine. I, I would agree. Is, yeah, and this is modeling that. And by the way, we have our own experiences with this. Anytime there is a public prayer, particularly a prayer in ordinance like the sacrament prayer, the idea, I think, is that as those words are being pronounced, we are repeating them in our own minds, and then we close together in the name of Christ. Yeah. And, and so this unity of thought and of purpose that happens in prayer, in unified prayer, and as we all know, in song, Carrie and I have done the psalm, talked about the psalms together before, uh, the, and, and the song of the righteous is also a prayer. That unity of vocalization or of mental thought is is really powerful, and they're modeling that for us. Yeah, that's beautiful. And then, I, I mean, I would even bring in, think about, they keep talking about baptism here. Think about the baptismal prayer. This is the prayer where it's done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, right? Even, even nice. when we talk about baptism, it, it has inherent in it this unity of the Godhead element, right? That's really nice. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so let's go through, and you've already talked about some of this in chapter 32, but I want to point out just a couple of things, uh, and and my uh, take on it that you can correct me on if you'd like to correct me. Um, I, I'm going to argue that in each iteration, so as I've said, we've got uh, 2 Nephi 31, 32, we've got uh, 3 Nephi 11, 3 Nephi 27, Moroni 8. Each one of those ends with an emphasis on the Holy Ghost, but each one has a, uh, emphasizes a different role of the Holy Ghost. So we get to 2 Nephi 32. So he's, we had the inclusio where he kind of closed it. I'm done talking about the doctrine of Christ at the end of, of chapter 31 with verse 21. But in 32, he opens it back up and he says, okay, you guys don't get it. So he doesn't say this is the doctrine of Christ, but I think he's making it pretty clear. I'm, I'm helping you understand it some more because it's become clear to me. You don't fully understand it. Um, and, and in particular, he's talking about the Holy Ghost. And he says, verse 2, do you not remember that I said unto you that after you'd received the Holy Ghost, you could speak with the tongue of angels? Now, I, I, this is so important. How could you speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? I think what he is telling us is that, and I'm, I'm reading in some things from uh, his teachings in, in the Gospel of John and in 3 Nephi 11 and 3 Nephi 27, but the Father and the Son— and the Holy Ghost are so unified, Christ only speaks what the Father would speak. We learn in, as uh, he's giving it in John 14 and 16, the Holy Ghost only teaches what the Father would teach. So that's part of why you can teach with the tongue of angels, because if you have the Holy Ghost with you, then you are speaking the Word of God. Right? right. That's, that's really what you're doing. So let's look at this, verse 3. Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Okay, so whatever angels are saying by the power of the Holy Ghost, not if they're saying without the power of the Holy Ghost, but if they speak with the power of the Holy Ghost, it's the word of Christ, and it is the word of Christ that we had to hold on to or feast upon if we're enduring to the end. So he's now starting to equate the Holy Ghost with the word of Christ, and I think that's going to become even more clear. So here we go. For behold, the words of Christ, as you said, will tell you all things what you should do, and then we get verse 4 where he starts to talk about asking and knocking, as you talked about. So there's this idea of prayer that we'll see is always part of this. Um, verse 5, For behold, again, I say unto you that if you will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what ye should do. All right, so verse 3, the Holy Ghost, or the word of Christ, would tell you all things you should do. The Holy Ghost, verse 5, will show you all things you should do. And we can make a difference between show and and tell, and, and there's something there. But if, if we look at it, I think with the emphasis that either telling or showing that it's all things you should do, he's just equated the word of Christ with the Holy Ghost and what it tells you, right? And he's told us that since we know that it's the word of Christ that we have to feast on to endure to the end, I think he has just told us 
what we need to do to endure to the end, which is you need to have the Holy Ghost with you and do whatever the Holy Ghost is telling you should do. So the emphasis is on the Holy Ghost as an instructor, as a guide, but you're not going to endure to the end if you're not feasting on what Christ has told you. So, oh, I had some quotes from uh, uh, President Oaks that I've had, I forgot to bring with me, but <laughs> in a number of places, so I won't give you the direct quote, but in a, I, I do them on the Follow Him podcast, so you can listen there. But uh, mm -hmm. in a number of places, uh, President Oaks has said that scriptures are not our ultimate thing we're looking for when we're reading the scriptures. It is what the Spirit teaches us while we read the scriptures. That that's what we're going for when we're reading, when when we're listening in general conference, when we're going to the temple, when we're reading the scriptures. The goal is to have the Spirit teach us. We'll see also sanctify us, edify us. Um, that's what we need. So I would argue that the Word of Christ, the Word of God, is whatever the Spirit is teaching you when you are doing any of the things that allow the Spirit to teach you, whether that's listening to modern prophets, reading ancient prophets, or any of this. You have to have, and this sounds like President Nelson saying you're not going to survive spiritually in the last days if you don't have revelation and asking us, how do you hear him? And so on. You have to have the spirit giving you revelation to endure to the end. If not, you're, if you're not following revelation all the way up to the end, you're not enduring to the end. And then note how in verse six, he says, and this is the doctrine of Christ. So he gives us the closing inclusio, even though he didn't give us the, the, the beginning inclusio. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second, but uh, and then he goes on to emphasize prayer again, which we've already talked about, but I want us to keep that in mind because we're going to see it coming up again and again. So any any comments you'd like to make on all of that, Sean, because yes. I talked way too much? No, no, that's really great. So uh, one of the things that occurs to me, Carrie, first of all, uh, is that the Holy Ghost, we've just talked about the unity of the Godhead. And so mm -hmm. if you are entering into the presence of God, you are the Holy Ghost receiving the Holy Ghost and the presence of the Holy Ghost is and, and maybe it's an early taste of what heaven will be like, but yes. you have, and, and think of our baptismal ordinance, you have cherubim, you have guardian angels, uh, you know, those witnesses on the side of the baptismal water, you've got a veil of the baptismal water, you pass through, and then you come into that other side, and you are given the presence of God uh, to yes. be with you. And, and so he's saying, if you're not, in, this is really simple, this is really plain, and if you can't understand pray, and then that will help you enter it back into the presence of God or receive the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, right? And, and that's going to, God's going to walk with you through the Holy Ghost throughout your life if you will seek after him. Good. And again, so baptism, one of the reasons baptism, and they keep talking about it, is so important because it helps us enter into that covenant, right? Well, it is how we enter into the covenant. And the covenant is about overcoming our separation from God and reestablishing relationship with God. And the way it happens is by immediately upon baptism, we receive that member of the Godhead. We, we don't phrase it that way very much, but that's a real thing. You receive a member of the Godhead. You have just overcome the separation of the fall in a very, very significant way. You are now, you can be one with the Holy Ghost who is one with the Son and the Father. And that's what Christ teaches at the Last Supper in John 14 and 16, like, okay, you, you, I, I won't be with you. The Holy Ghost will be, and it's the same thing. Just like I'm unified with the Father, the Holy Ghost is, so it's like you're unified with me and the Father and so on. It's a real deal. And then, as you said, that's part of why prayer is emphasized in all of these, because if we really are going to have communion with God through the Holy Ghost, if we're going to have that unity, join in that unity that the three enjoy, we have to be asking for it, seeking for it. And, and that's one of the keys for having that spirit, that revelation with us, right? It's, it's huge. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son, and the Holy Ghost then teaches us how to walk forward. And, and back to this tabernacle imagery, you're in the house with this blazing menorah, and, and those covenantal blessings, you're, you're in an early taste of heaven, in liminal state, where you're not just in mortality anymore, you're in this sort of state where you're still walking through mortality, but with God walking covenantally by your side. Beautiful, beautiful. So I just want to read the last part of verse 6 in section uh, 2 Nephi 32 because it propels us to 3 Nephi 11. So here in verse 6, after he says this is the doctrine of Christ, he says, There will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. And when he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh, the things which he shall say unto you 
shall ye observe to do. So basically saying, this is the doctrine. You're getting no more until he comes to visit you. Then he can do whatever he wants. But when he comes, he says the exact same thing. So let's let's jump forward to 3 Nephi 11. Uh, let, I let know. The, the, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Carrie. Let me pause. And maybe uh, uh, Carrie has some things that he's going to show, I think, in 3 Nephi 11 and then 3 Nephi 27. So maybe, Carrie, why don't I give some final thoughts uh, from 2 Nephi 31 and 32? And then yeah. sort of as a, a continuation of this, it'll just be Carrie that sort of walks everybody through to the end. How does that sound to you, Carrie? That sounds great. Okay. So uh, two other points that I'd like to make here, we've talked about the tongue of angels, speaking with the tongue of angels. One of the insights that I gained as I was studying this at one point is that uh, Nephi frames learning how to speak God's language, uh, learning how to understand the Holy Ghost, which is one of our great challenges and opportunities in mortality as language acquisition. And and I think that's helpful. There's some helpful um comparisons if you're learning a language you make a lot of mistakes but you have to walk forward boldly and with faith those of you who are a little timid and are trying to learn a language you know it's really hard you have to just jump in there and give it your best shot but they say you have to make a million mistakes before you ever gain a language and so we sometimes i think are a little too timid a little too fearful about our efforts to follow the spirit and it's laced with this oh am i going to do this wrong am i going to get it wrong it's language acquisition you walk forward in faith and then god it's like a google maps right he can't guide you while you're standing still You've got to walk, and then he can help you zero in as you're practicing. So beautiful. One one little thought, and then let me give another uh, a second little thought uh, before I I think I'm going to sign off here, and that is that uh, Christ at the center giving life is crucial, and sometimes to do lists can help us when we've lost our way to just go back to that which is simple. This sort of five point path of yeah. faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring, that can be helpful. And I just want to submit to you, you can use that simple pathway in your careers, in your schooling. You're lost, you, you're failed, you're fallen again, you don't know who you are or where you're headed. Come back, okay, what are those five points? How can faith in Christ help me what does repentance mean in this stage? And, and then what? Ca how can I recommit to a certain course of action? And then how will that the, the fire of commitment uh, burn with me to lead me through this path? And that can be very cyclical, obviously, in a salvational sense. This means nothing without Christ. Uh, and that is true in our lives as well. But, but that, the simplicity of that path uh, I don't want us to lose the power of those points that are there. So that's that's beautiful. We'll cut the episode here. We'll have a second half of the episode. Uh, and if you won't find out about the other roles of the Holy Ghost that are emphasized if you don't stick with us. But uh, let me uh, just tell you, Sean, how grateful I am for uh, the, the what you're teaching here and uh, that for that reminder there at the end, but also, the way that we can see the temple in here. And I hope that this allows us to take the doctrine of Christ with us as we go to the temple and see the symbolism there and understand uh, and take Nephi's vision with us as we go to the temple and see how many ways God is trying to teach us about how we return to him and how Christ is the focus of all of them. Thank you, Carrie. As always, it's so fun to do this with you, like when our, our minds start pinging with each other. By the way, for those listening, I have to add, I've had a sneak peek of the different roles that are going to be in 3 Nephi 11 and 3 Nephi 27 that are there that uh, I had not seen before uh, Dr. Mel, uh, Mulestein shared them with me. And uh, this is powerful stuff. So uh, you, you've only got step, uh, you know, aspect one, so to speak of the Holy Ghost's ministry. So I, I'm excited for what you're going to get here in this last part. And you'll get it without me getting in the way of it. So that uh, You haven't been getting in the way at all. You make it better. I, I, I love these discussions. It is the discussion that makes it fun. And we, we all learn from each other. That's the value of these podcasts that we get to Agreed. learn uh, from each other. So thank Agreed. you. Good to be with you, Carrie. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, my, my pleasure. All right. Take Bye. care.